at times I've been accused of being less than humble because I express that I'm recovered. And, and I would, would say to anybody on the topic of humility, everybody bows to something. I used to bow at the altar of addiction. I used to bow to drugs. I used to bow to alcohol. I used to bow to my impulses. And now I bow at the altar of health and wellness. I bow at the altar of recovery from self-harming behavior and confusing, misconstrued, unhelpful thinking. I bow at the altar of recovery. I bow at the altar of connection, and I bow at the altar of love. Thank you very much for having us, Tommy. So, so you know, grateful to be sitting in this chair with my fellow Recovery 2.0 family. Uh, my name is Luis, um, and I'm a human on this path of recovery and discovery. And I came into this community right at the onset, I guess shortly after you had published your book. And at that point, I had, I'd been on the journey of recovery through the 12 steps for about five years. And the thing that struck me the most, the, the, the day that I, that I met you, which was via Zoom, in the rooms.com, was that I could not find the trays of either, you know, sort of shame, there's no shame, and I couldn't find the trace of addiction either. And I contrasted that immediately with my experience walking into a 12-step meeting the first time, where I was told that I would be an addict my whole life, and that I, it was something that I would need to manage. And it was so terrifying to hear that. As if walking into that meeting, that first meeting wasn't terrifying enough, and the reasons that led me to that meeting. And yet, when I met you, I recognized that somehow you were free of addiction. And every path, every step I've taken in, in this community, in our beloved community, has actually put more and more distance for me personally from the frequency of addiction. I'm not there yet. And so I, the, the, my question to you this morning is, in your own path, in your own life, but also in general for recovering humans, is it possible to shed that old skin of addiction and be free of this once and for all? Thank you so much for this inquiry. Um, I honestly can't think of a more important question in the entire universe of possible questions we could cover when it comes to addiction and recovery in our modern era. This is so, so important. So let's dig right in. The thought process of is there a cure for addiction has an addictive element to it. The thought process itself. This idea of there will come a point in time where I'm cured of it is a, a thing that people will seek for. They'll look for that and they'll try to achieve it. This, this moment in time where all of a sudden, okay, I'm now healed. I'm now cured from addiction. Is very elusive, very seductive, and a very addictive thought unto itself. And I'm not trying to be clever when I say, you'll be healed from all addiction when you no longer seek to be healed from it when you're no longer looking for a cure, but rather you're just here in the now, in this present moment with what is. When people think about healing addiction or curing addiction, 
let's just look at some of the grosser forms of addiction that we notice in our society. So let's look at drugs and alcohol, for example. So drug addiction, uh, you know, these days we're, we're most concerned, uh, rightfully so, about opiate addiction in all of its forms. So the opiates, heroin, uh, all of the, the, the narcotic painkillers, this class of drugs, highly addictive physically and in every way. And so when we think about curing addiction, what do we really mean when we're talking about, for example, uh, a person who's addicted to heroin or another opiate? You might say, well, that person is addicted to that drug, and we would consider them cured when they're no longer addicted to that drug. And I guess we're talking about physically, the, the physical dependence to that opiate is relieved, so the body is healed. But beyond that, the psychological addiction of returning to an opiate long after we've relieved ourselves of the physical addiction, that, that psychological dependence would also have been, would need to have been satisfied for us to consider a person healed from that addiction. So if we're talking, if your question is about, can we be that person who was at one point addicted to heroin, who no longer is physically addicted and no longer psychologically addicted, is that possible? Meaning, and I think we're really speaking about the difficulty of the psychological piece, meaning, could I, as someone who was once addicted to heroin, sincerely and truly not desire to return to it even if I could return to it without these horrendous consequences, even if no one would find out, if somehow, hypothetically, I could get away with it. Is that possible? And so people have asked me before, you know, Tommy, you were a heroin addict. It's true. I was addicted to heroin very severely. If you could use heroin today. No one would know. You could have a hall pass. You could have a weekend and go back to your drug of choice and get away with it. Really, truly get away with it. Would you do it? Now, I say, of course, and for most people, it's not of course, but I would say, of course, I would not. There's no part of me that desires to return to a self-harming behavior. There's no part of me that would enjoy what some people would consider a hall pass to me would be a descent into a certain hell, a realm of hell, hurting my body, hurting my mind, disconnecting my spirit, even if I could get away with it. Like, why would I do that? So in the sense of addiction to heroin, I guess you could say from these in this particular parameter, uh, I'm healed from that. I have no charge. I literally haven't had a thought of using any drug, even cannabis, nothing, or alcohol in over 30 years. Haven't had a single thought of, wouldn't that be nice if? Not one. So in that sense, I'm free from that addiction. I'm free from drug addiction. I've healed. I'm what I refer to as recovered. I recovered the, the part of myself that I needed to recover in order to be in a life that I love so much I wouldn't threaten by returning to a previous self-harming behavior, returning to a previous level of consciousness, which no longer serves me today. That's the same with all the drugs that I became addicted to, cocaine, cannabis, um, I would even use psychedelics uh, as things that I became addicted to because I continued to do them even after they were no longer supporting me, no longer teaching me something new. They had become something that was harmful in my life, no longer supportive or productive for me. But I kept doing them anyway. Were they physically addictive? No. In the sense of building up a tolerance like you would build up for an opiate? No. But for someone to say that those drugs aren't at all addictive in my opinion, is not a complete understanding of addiction. So to fully answer this question, let's just go to my definition. 
Addiction is any behavior you continue despite negative consequences that they bring into your life. You continue this behavior, it brings negative consequences into your life. That's addiction. To me, it's, it's just very simple. So that broadens a person's understanding of what addiction actually is. And I talk about the big six addictions where most human beings get caught. So drugs, alcohol, people, so that's relationship addictions, sex addiction, food, of course, food addictions, eating disorders, uh, emotional eating, binge eating, um, money-based addictions, so being constantly in a state of debt, shopping addiction, gambling addiction related to money. Uh, workaholism in a way, in a way related to money also. And then of course, the, the sixth is of course technology and the addiction to technology as a, as a way to move through time and space that's incredibly distracting and separating. So these are all addictive, addictive behaviors. And beyond those addictive behaviors, we have more subtle addictions, what I call the four aggravations, negative thinking, self-doubt, procrastination, and resentment. And when I talk about those four aggravations, usually someone will say, well, wait a minute, Tommy, those aren't addictions. I don't crave those things. I'm not craving my negative thinking. And I'll say, yes, it's true. You don't crave those things, but they fit my definition of addiction, which is any behavior you continue despite it bringing ne negative consequences into your life. So from this expanded perspective on addiction, you're asking me, can a person truly live free from addiction? So, and you also said that when you met me, you didn't see a trace of, of, of the frequency of addiction. And I consider that one of the highest compliments. Um, and what I could say is it is possible that in the moment you met me, I was completely present. It is possible that when you met me, I was fully present in this moment. Neither plagued by memory or the past, nor projecting a worry or a concern into the future. That I had, through practice, through uh, internal circumstances and also external circumstances, in the moment where you met me, it's possible that, that you and I together shared that moment of presence. How beautiful. And I know from my own awareness and my own exploration of my own journey that I'm a beginner to my next step, just like you are, just like we all are. Everybody a beginner to their next step. So for me, while I'm not working on healing myself from drug addiction or alcoholism because I'm recovered from those things, I'm still subject to the human condition. And that means that I have an ego. My ego expresses itself through thoughts some thoughts which I can attach to. My ego expresses itself through emotions, emotions which can drive my behavior in some pretty wacky and unproductive directions. And I have, to, I have to watch my relationship with food and my relationship with people and my relationship with this body and the way I, I manage my sexual energy in this world as, as a married man in a committed relationship. And, and that's actually beside the point, because if I wasn't a married man, I'd still have to manage my energy just the same way. And I have to manage my uh, sense of abundance and creativity, how I want to show up in the world, how I can serve. I need to be watching and be aware of, this is my process as a human being, I'm just sharing with you, that I consider all of those things potential areas of addictive behavior where if I'm not vigilant and I'm not paying attention, I can definitely get off center and you could encounter me in an unpresent moment. Now, bless you for saying that you caught me at a moment when there was not a shred <laughs> in your mind of, of addiction. But you see, I'm not looking for a cure. What I'm looking for is presence in this moment. And I want everyone who is listening to this or watching this to really think about that for a moment. When we take a pill, and this is one of the problems I feel with trying to treat addiction uh, purely with medicine, like, like uh, pharmaceutical medicine, 
pharmacological approaches to healing addiction. When we take a pill, we're looking for um, predictable outcome. You know, I take this pill, it makes me feel this way, or I have this kind of relief, uh, and I like that kind of relief, and so I'd like to continue to take these pills. Makes sense. And we call that medicine. Medicine, in that sense, is not really medicine if you continue that for the rest of your life, meaning a real medicine makes itself obsolete. So if I'm taking, you know, a pill to treat a particular condition, my hope is it's not just dealing with symptoms and hiding those symptoms, but it's actually getting to the root cause of the condition itself. Otherwise, I wouldn't use the word medicine for what that is. I might use uh, a, a symptom suppressor. It's a symptom suppressor. Like when I was using cannabis, cannabis for me was a symptom suppressor. It created uh, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, it shifted my emotional state. It helped me to conveniently like not deal with some difficult emotions, which later on, by the way, were waiting for me when I gave up cannabis. <laughs> I found that out <laughs> the hard way. Um, but, but this is all simply to say that I think the problem with taking a pill is we're looking for a cure. Even if we're looking for a cure that lasts eight hours, and then we have to repeat that process of taking the pill again. For me, I'm looking to live as fully as possible. That means I am interested in my thoughts. I'm interested in how I relate with my mind. I'm interested in creativity and spontaneity and joy in my life. I feel that the emotional state of the human being is part of how we learn to show up fully in, in our life and in the world, that our joyful emotions are obviously beautiful gifts for us to experience joy. Our challenging emotions are also gifts in that there is something to learn within those challenges. Any way you look at it, the, the emotional state is trying to show us, give us an experience, help us learn something, and going through difficult emotions and learning from those is how we move forward into emotional maturity and also spiritual maturity. So we're growing up, but we're also waking up. And so you see, to look for a cure is going to cause me to want to be able. So, for example, some people would say, Tommy, so you've recovered from drug addiction? I'll say yes. You've recovered from alcoholism? I'll say yes. And they'll say, well, can you take a drink in that case? Can you smoke pot? Can you, you know, go have a psychedelic trip? Why not? Is that, you know, you're recovered, so you must not be an addict anymore. So those things wouldn't cause any problems for you. <laughs> To me, it's just, it's just absolutely the wrong question that comes from somebody who is having a very hard time imagining a life without drugs and alcohol, <laughs> especially a joyful life without drugs and alcohol. So you see, if I were in the energy of wanting to smoke pot, if I had that craving activated in my mind, particularly in my mind, it is only a matter of time until I am going to smoke pot, engage with that substance or any other substance. If it's in my mind, I'm going to go there. The fact that it's just not relevant for me, that it has no bearing on my life, that I feel that if there was any gift from it before, that I learned everything I needed to learn from it, and I choose today not to go there because I prefer the mental clarity, my connection to intuition, the, the, the creativity and the spontaneity that I have, which are so joyful for me, the humor and the connection and the depth of experience that I get to have in this life because I don't smoke pot, because I don't drink, I wouldn't choose to give up this life for anything. Now, if you consider that a cure, okay. Then in that sense, you know, for the moment, I'm relieved of any charge or interest. It has no relevance for me any longer. I'm just simply not interested. 
my attention is going elsewhere. You know, I, even today, I'm not like, well, I'm cured from addiction. Like, no, I'm, I'm a human being on the path of discovery. And I'm going to experience my mind and my ego, and I'm going to experience addictive impulses, you know, on a regular basis, just not in the way that most people are thinking about and not related to drugs or alcohol. There's been a real recovery there. And, and in that recovery, that doesn't mean that I can now go and use drugs and alcohol with impunity. It means that I would have no desire to. It, it just simply doesn't make sense in the world that I'm living in anymore. So I think that's the best for right now that I can answer that question. Um, once an addict, always an addict? Uh, no, I don't consider myself an addict. I just consider, at this point, I consider myself a human being, a human being on the path of what we like to call in Recovery 2.0, the path of discovery, because I'm discovering all the time, I'm learning all the time, and I, and I want to be very clear on this. At times, I've been accused of being less than humble because I express that I'm recovered. And, and I would, would say to anybody on the topic of humility, everybody bows to something. I used to bow at the altar of addiction. I used to bow to drugs. I used to bow to alcohol. I used to bow to my impulses. If I want it, it then go after it and go get it. Take it from the world, Tommy. Go get it. And now I bow at the altar of health and wellness. I bow at the altar of recovery from self-harming behavior and confusing, misconstrued, unhelpful thinking. I bow at the altar of recovery. I bow at the altar of connection. And I bow at the altar of love. And I, and I believe that I have access to greater intelligence, not within me, but in, in the greater intelligence that's around me. There's an access point there because of the cornerstone of the abstinence from drugs and alcohol that I've chosen in this life and the people and the environments that I get to be around. So I, I want to ask what comes up for you, if anything, as you hear me speaking on, on, on this topic. Thank you very much. That was, a, that was a beautiful answer, extensive, and, and I relate to it. You know, I relate to this idea of when I am fully present in the moment, when I am aware of my breath, I'm not in that frequency of addiction. I can relate to that. I can also relate to the fact that I haven't had a drink, a single you know, drop of alcohol in five years, and it doesn't interest me. I can go to a bar and sit next to my wife who will have an occasional wine you know, and, and, or tequila <laughs> and, and like just be happy that she can drink and that she enjoys it, that she can have one or maybe two, and that's it for her without having any pressure or any need to go there. Um, I can say the same thing. Well, drugs were never really my issue. I tried a few. I was very lucky. I think, uh, you know, that's, that's a rough one. And yet, you know, around the issues of food and sexuality, I still struggle. You know, those relationships that are part of being a human on this planet, we all have to eat. We all have to relate to each other sexually at certain moments of life, at least. You know, they, they still weigh over me. And, uh, and I'm okay. I'm, I've made strides in both. I'm entering a water five-day water fast with our brother, Dr. Nick Jensen, next week, uh, trying to fine-tune and redefine that relationship. And, and just like I have gone on, you know, periods of extended sexual abstinence. Uh, trying to really relate to it, that sexual energy differently. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, the first thing that's so inspiring about what you're, you're talking about, when you speak about alcohol, I can truly hear that freedom. You're not 
uh, battling your way through cravings related to alcohol. You're free from that. There's a freedom there. You can be around other people who, and, and it's, there's no judgment of those other people. It's just, hey, great for them. That, that works for them. And, and I'm free from this. And my choice is to not be there today. So one of the reasons that's so important is because I think this is not everybody, but many, many people on the path of recovery, traditional recovery, and also, you know, sp specifically 12-step recovery, especially at the beginning, people are not aware of the fact that they could actually be free from this thing someday. I think people have this mistaken concept that it'll always be a struggle. And nothing could be further from the truth. This is one of the most important things that someone could understand about re recovery is that, please believe us. You know, first of all, you have to sort of believe what I'm saying, what you're saying, that you could be free from the thing that today is an addiction for you, that plagues you in your mind. You could be completely free and at peace with it. And it's very important that you realize that so that you know what to shoot for. Because that, that old saying, once an addict, always an addict, can be very depressing, very off-putting. Because that means, wow, I'm always going to struggle. I'm always going to be sick. And, you know, I would simply say that you're not sick at all. Even right now, even if you're still struggling with addiction, it, it, it's just that you, you have a misunderstanding in the body and the mind. And there's a conflict for you. I say that because you recognize that you'd like to change in, in these ways. And it's difficult to do. But now you've got an opportunity to move towards this thing that we call freedom. It's not just abstinence and, well, I guess I'll be white knuckling it for the rest of my life. No. It's freedom. I'm moving towards this place where I can truly be free and be the creative and spontaneous and happy being that I believe is part of all of our God-given, spirit-given, higher power-given right to be here and to pursue that. So that's the first thing I'm hearing from you, Luis, and that's just incredible. And I, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that you share that and, and are, are the embodiment of that. At the same time, you're also expressing these other areas of challenge and struggle. And I, of course, relate to those areas too, food, sexuality. And, you know, we're talking about things that have been challenging to human beings from the beginning of time. You know, the, 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 we'll call these like, you know, what is it? It's, it's, uh, we've heard about these things called attachment, pride, greed, lust, and anger. <laughs> Those things, you know, that most everybody everywhere is dealing with that if you have a lot of these things in your life, it's very difficult to be happy. And so I'm just bringing those things under the umbrella of addiction. And I'm saying, hey, these are addictive sort of thought patterns, mental patterns, and we need to work those out too. What I'm hearing you do is putting yourself in a pole position on a daily basis to be able to learn and to grow and to work out these challenges of the human condition. And that's so inspiring to me and so beautiful. And what I want to report in from the field is I've made such huge progress around food and around uh, sex and sexuality and relationships. Huge progress. So, so much so that most of my older friends, really, they will look at me and my relationship with my wife, for example, 22 years now. They knew me back in the day before I sort of, you know, got my game together, let's put it that way, gently. And they're like, how in God's name did someone like you get to be with someone like her? And to be successful in that relationship, how did you do it? <laughs> and so I, I take great pride in the fact that I've come from very, very unbelievably humble beginnings. You know, some days the addictive chatter of my mind around lust and around greed and around, you know, uh, experiences in the world. And that can be at a high volume. And the big teaching for me at this point is I don't judge myself for being imperfect in this world. I'm not beating myself up. And I'm in, as one of our teachers said, I'm in a constant shower of self-forgiveness. And that's an important statement is let's, let's give ourselves a break. We're in the human condition. Let's not be surprised when we make mistakes. We're supposed to. Let's try to learn from our mistakes and move forward so that we can make new and better mistakes later on, you know, and just keep growing from there. 
So what I'm hearing from you is this very inspiring, very humble, very beautiful, you know, expression of, hey, I've made incredible progress, still challenged in these ways, uh, and I'm, I'm in a dance with, with my life and my life's challenges, and I just think it's fantastic, inspiring, and beautiful. And I want to thank you so much for being in the circle today. 